If we were, there, there are lots of definitions or let's say characteristics w that we could put forth. Uh, all of us have, um, you know, some sins. How would we d define that? And what what really defines a Christian? What what is the mark? I would say the thing that is the identifying characteristic. It's really wanted to answer the question: What is a Christian? Um, what separates a Christian from a non-Christian? What is that defining, distinguishing characteristic that you will see in anybody who is born of God? So, you know, we, we would say, well, it has to do perhaps with, you know, what we believe. We believe who Jesus is, and, and we have a, a belief a system centered around him and his teachings. Uh, it would obviously have to do with, with, with how we live our lives, you know, what it is we do and what it is we don't do. So we, we follow those prescriptions of, of Jesus about life. Um, of course, if, if a person is a, a Christian, they would generally have, you know, church membership somewhere, that you're part of a church family, that you, um, you, you pertain, you, you, you interact with, other believers. And so, you know, what is it really, though, that, that underlies all those things? Because so many people call themselves Christians. In our culture, even today, I mean, I would say all of us know that back in the, you know, latter part of the 20th century, um, how many people, if you just polled the, the general population, and particularly in the South, as, you know, we're known the Bible Belt, I mean, almost everybody is going to say they're a Christian. Um, I think I even heard uh, something the other day, you know, Taylor Swift said, you know, she's a Christian. Um, but what is one? What's a real one versus a non-real one? What's the real article and, and what, is, what is just a, a lookalike or a counterfeit? What is it that makes a person truly a child of God, born again, um, Adopted into the family of God, what is it? So the word that I've already mentioned to you uh, is the word life. It's the word life. In John 5, nine times, just in the few verses I'm going to read, we either, well, we see eight times the word life, one time the word live. But this seems to be so much of the point of John 5. It has to do with life. Here's what he says. Jesus says, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. Now here is a scathing statement to the religious leaders of the day. Those who should know. Those who were the, from all appearances, are the godly in society Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. So here even the most, from all appearances sake, the godliest, those who hold to the law, those who who are the, the judges of the law. He says, you're unwilling to come to me. I am life. So all of those, the father has life. He gives the son life. The life is within him. And, and you, could, you could look up that word and go on and on about this, this particular description of salvation. All of these people, they had the scriptures, they had the law, they had the religion, they had their heritage. They knew what the prophets had said. They had no excuse. They knew it. They should have known it, but they did not have life. 
that's really, to me, what Christianity is. If you want to talk about what is a Christian, what denotes, what defines a Christian, it's the life of God in the soul of a person. We know it's a different type of life from the one that we have in the flesh because a transformation had to occur because there was no life before. Something happened to give a new life, a real life, in this person that they didn't have before. So we know from our, our, our Pilgrim's Progress study, the very opening of that is graceless, as he was known before his conversion, came to understand that there was life available somewhere out there and the reason that mattered because he was destined for destruction for death and he could not escape it there was nothing he could do he didn't know where to go and he said unless we escape or escape is provided for us we will all die because everybody in the world is living in the city of destruction that's what the world is it's the city of destruction so he said there's life somewhere there's life but it's not here we're going to die what are we going to do so what he was saying was, when he knew that there was life, he was identifying salvation with life. That was a synonym for salvation. So what does he do? Everybody's trying to keep him from leaving. Don't seek after Christ is basically what you know, they're saying. Don't, don't, go, don't go toward Christ. Don't, just stay here. Stay where you are. Live in the, in, in, in the flesh as you, as you have. But in order that they might not influence him to return, he sticks his fingers in his ears where he can't hear them. And what does he cry? Life, 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 eternal life. That's what he was after. It wasn't heaven, really. It wasn't some better form of existence here. He said, there's death where I am. There's life somewhere else. How do I find it? How do I find life? Life and death. I mean, we think about it probably every day because that's the ultimate issue for every one of us. We're either living or we're dead. And we know that death is coming. Life is what we're after. We would like to have an enjoyable life, a prosperous life, a comfortable life, and when as long a life as possible. I mean, all of us, that's why we take supplements. That's why we go to the doctor. You know, that, that's why we exercise. That's why, because we want life. That's what it's all about. If we don't have that, we don't exist. So life is the ultimate for us. Everything boils down to life and death. There are two types of life and there are two types of death. We're all born physically. We all die physically. The physical. There's also spiritual life, and not everybody has that. There's also spiritual death, and thankfully not everybody experiences that. But those who are outside of Christ have no spiritual life, and they end up in spiritual death. Under the judgment of God, separated from the mercy and the grace of God, under the wrath of God. There are two types. So why did Jesus come? John 10 says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and, de uh, steal, kill, and destroy. I came why? That they may have life and have it abundantly. That doesn't mean prosperity. That doesn't mean material things. It's the realness of the life of God. A life that, that lives as we were made to live. By God, for God, to God, enjoying God, and to live eternally with God after we die. Why did he come? He said, I came that they may have life. Now, when that life comes, it brings change. You cannot have Christ and remain the same. He never allows that. He never hints at that. Everything is, if you belong to me and you have my life, it remakes you. It reshapes your, your life entirely, the total orientation. You no longer actually belong to yourself. You belong to me because I bought you. My blood, my life bought you, purchased you. It is transformative, and it really can't be denied. So if we can say I'm in Christ, but not much has changed about me, then we have to, make it, we have to really be honest with ourselves. Is there a reality of life in me, 
Or do I claim something, and maybe I even like it, but there's no power involved? Nothing's changed. Because what is produced of God that man cannot do will produce a fruit of God that man has no authority to create or to produce. He has no power to produce it. Life will always, real life will always produce results. So whether it's in a plant and you planted tomatoes, it's going to grow and it's going to produce or it's going to die. If it's an animal, if it's a tree, if it's a human being, if there's life in it, it produces something. It can't just stay what it because it can't stay stagnant or it dies. Life always has a result to it. So the question that all of us should ask ourselves who profess Christ is, what is the evidence of the life of God in me? What's the evidence of life? Is there sap in the tree? Are are there leaves on the branches? Is anything happening that, that looks like God, that is produced by God? What's the evidence? Paul says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. And he's talking to people who are professing believers. He's not talking to... You know, the the, the pagans. So he's saying, those of you in Corinth, he said, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. So what kind of test would that be? What does that look like to test myself? He says, examine yourself. What do I see? What's the reality? What do I, what is being produced in me that that, that reflects Christ? He said, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Do you not recognize it? Do you not see it? Unless, he says, you fail the test. He's saying, be honest with yourself. Don't just go based on something that happened some point in the past. Is there life? If you're in Christ, then a transformation has occurred and is continuing to to occur. It's ongoing. Salvation is not complete until we die. It's an ongoing process. So this transformation has to be there or else we would say, well, I don't really see the fruit. But Paul says again that we all with unveiled face beholding as in in a mirror the glory of the Lord that we are being transformed into the same image of Christ from glory to glory just as from the Lord the Spirit. Transformation. So the Christian's way of thinking It's different. It should be different than the world, and it should be different than what I was before Christ. My desires are going to be different. My affections are going to be different. The things that bring joy and sorrow are going to be different. My hopes and my dreams will be different. The responses to life's circumstances will be different because God is the one who is ordering my mind And the way that I see everything, we have completely different purposes. Our perspective has changed. You know, all the big whys of life, the rationale, like why? What's the the rationale? Those kind of questions. Or again, the perplexities of life, those things that that cause fear and frustration or, or disappointment. We have new answers to those questions when we're in Christ because the life of Christ dictates. It governs. It changes. It reshapes who I am And so my whole orientation of life is different. I love the word conversion when it refers to salvation. I I think I mentioned it last week because it, it really better describes that you were this and now you're that. Saved is a good biblical word, but saved is multifaceted. But to say you've been converted, you know, I used to be. So look at Paul. Look at what Paul was prior to his conversion. Hated Christ, blasphemed God put to death people, they wanted to destroy the church. When he was converted, that's not just a better Paul. That's a whole new Paul, one that had never existed before. That's what conversion looks like. Is there that type of thing in my life that would testify to the reality of God? So Jesus, again, speaking, says, I truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. A literal change had occurred, a change. 
Christianity is not a decision. It's not a decision. You can decide something today. You might decide differently tomorrow. It's not a decision. We are never told to decide for Christ in Scripture. We're told to believe. Repent and believe. That's the command of God. If I'm basing everything on a decision, well, am I, how am I doing? Am I holding on tight? Am I, you know, is it based on what I said I was going to do? Or is it based on the reality of, of Christ? Christianity is life. So is there the life of God in you? And how can you tell if we examine ourselves, what are the signs of life? What in your life and my life bears testimony to the life of God in me? Not what is your testimony in words. What in your life testifies, just bears witness to the reality of a new life empowered by the Spirit of God in you. John says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man. So nothing that man can do, whether it be your heritage, whether it be you know, the, 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 the physical aspect of birth, whether it be uh, making a choice, like maybe even like the, the idea of adopting someone, that, that man's, man is not involved in that. Three times, three different ways. Not born of blood, the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but they're born of God. Born. When someone is born, they begin what? They begin life. It's life. That's the difference. That's the distinguishing aspect. Is there the life of God in me? If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. New things have come. It's because there's a new life, a new person. And this can only come from the Lord. And I love what 1 Corinthians 1.30 says. It says it's by his doing that you're in Christ Jesus. It's by the Father giving birth to children that there is now a new life. And that's why when Paul says it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives. It lives present, continuous, ongoing, lives in me. There is a power resident in me. It's not theoretical. It's not philosophical. It's not a mindset or a perspective of life. It's not a moral or ethical code that I go by. It's real and it's active and there is power. So going back to one of the verses we read earlier, Jesus said, if any man is in him has believed his word he's passed out of death into life we were in death so what about that death ephesians 2 and you were dead in your trespasses and sins but god being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our transgressions he made us alive together with christ we were dead he had to make us alive we didn't exist spiritually. He had to give us birth. Romans 8, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death because the mind that's set on the flesh is just death. But the mind set on the spirit, now that's where life and peace are found. It's the life of God. It's the power of God. Ezekiel 36 and 37, boy, powerful. We, I spoke of this, I don't know, two or three months ago. And I don't remember the number, but how many times does God say, I will, I will, I will. I'll take out your heart of stone. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. I will cause you to walk in my ways. I will, I will. You go to chapter 37, the valley of, of, of the dead bones, they're bleached, they're dry. They have no hint of life. The marrow is gone. There's nothing there. And yet he makes them come to life through the prophesying of the word and the calling of the spirit of God to bring life into those bones. It's the only way that life could come to them. But it was all about life. Death in the flesh. Death in sin. Life only by the power of God. That's what being a Christian is. Is there life? What are the signs Again, John 1, in him was life. 
John 5, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives life, even so the Son gives life to whom he wishes. In John 6, it's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I've spoken to you, now that's where you'll find spirit and life. My words impart life. So is there life? Is there spiritual life, the life of God? Is there something just beyond a belief system? So Christianity, and I, I remember thinking this before talking about Israel um, uh, years ago, you know, and you've got the controversy between the Muslims and the Jews and the Christians and all that. And they would say, and this is, a, this is the Christian part of the city, and, or this is the Muslim part of the city. Or, I thought the Christian part is, so everybody that lives there is a Christian. Well, no, they hold to the teachings of Jesus. They hold to the ethical or moral code. And not to say that there aren't Christians. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that just to, to classify someone or some group as Christian because that's the teachings they hold to does not necessarily mean that they are Christian. But that's their belief system. That's how they govern and operate their lives is based on that belief system. So... Just like with the Pharisees, looking at them, do I have life or do I have religion? Do I have life or do I have a moral code? Do I have life or do I have conservative American values? Is there life? Am I resting on a decision that was made sometime in the past or is there life? I go back to when I was six and a half almost, May the 10th, 1964. I walked an aisle. I prayed a prayer with the pastor. Wasn't pressured by anybody. There was a sincerity, whatever little I actually knew. But I made a profession of faith. About 10 years later, 16, 17 years of age, probably just struggling with doubt. Maybe somebody come and preached at, you know, revival or something. I don't know what it was, but... I mean, I had a lump in my throat, literally a lump in my throat. And I was like, I've got to deal with this issue. I just, I don't know if I'm saved. And uh, so I finally got up the courage to talk to my dad. And it took a lot for me to come to that point. We went out on the picnic table in the backyard and we sat down. Because he was the one who would counsel me whenever I had made that profession 10 years earlier. So he would be the one to talk to. So we talked. He took us both back to that time. Remember sitting on the steps of our, of our uh, basement when we were talking about it that Sunday that I'd made that profession. So here I am 10, 11, whatever, 12 years later, and there's just like, I don't know. So what we did is we went back to when I was six and talked through all of that. If you stop there, if that's the only place you go, you're only looking back, I believe... And, and in my experience was I came away with no more assurance than I had before I did, before I talked to him. It did not give me an assurance that I knew him based on what I already knew had happened. I was there. I knew. Or you can come away from that experience and say, okay, it's settled. You know, I did it. I, I, that was put it in human terms. I accomplished that. And so, okay, I'm safe. I'm good to go on and live my life. And I could falsely be thinking that I'm a believer when I'm not because I'm putting my confidence in something I did 10 or maybe in other people's cases 20, 30, 50 years ago. Sincerity, which I was, doesn't save anybody. Sincerity is not sufficient. Sincerity does not do anything to my soul. Only God can give me life. I sincerely come to God, but only he can give me life. So when someone says, well, were you sincere when you prayed? That doesn't matter because maybe at the moment I was sincere. I know too many people. I can name their names that were sincere when they prayed and they were not saved because it was for the moment. It was an emotional thing or it was a rescue. I need help. God, save me. I'm coming to you. And so they pray this prayer and they invite Jesus into their life, not because they want Christ, it's because they want the blessings, the benefits, the rescue, whatever it might be of Christ. God is the one who has to save. Only God can give new life. That's why it uses the term born, born of God. Literally, born of God. 
So has God acted in my life? Or did I simply trust in something that somebody led me through? Not to say you can't be saved in that, but there's got to be more. There's got to be an ongoing evidence. So the questions that my dad should have asked me should have been pertaining to the life I was living. He should have addressed things like, well, what are your desires now? You're a teenager. You know the realities of things teenagers become aware of? What are your desires? What are your affections? What is your appetite for God? Do you want God? Do you want, actually want his rule in your life? Or again, do you just want rescue from hell? Are you seeking God? Are you actively pursuing God? Do you love his word? Is his word the authority in your life? Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Do you hate the sin that still is in you? Does it bother you? Are you struggling with that? The struggle is good. At least if you hate it, you know that you're wanting what's right, even if you can't accomplish it, as Paul said. I do what I don't want to, and I don't do what I wish I could. Do you love his church? Do you love the people of God? Is that who you gravitate toward? Do you want fellowship with others that know Christ? What about your prayer life? What's that like? Are you growing in these things? Is there a, a longing for something more with God than what you have? And are you seeking after it? And are you using all the means that he's given us to pursue that? What are the pertinent current of the moment questions that need to be asked? Not what did I do on May the 10th, Mother's Day of 1964. It didn't help me. Is there life? Are there signs of life? If so, you'll see them. It'll be evident. Not perfection, but there's life. That's one of the beautiful things about when he talks about the, 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 the bruised reed and, and the, just the, the smoking flax. Those are symbols of weakness. But he says, I'm not going to break off the reed. I'm not going to put out the smoking flax. In other words, like the wick. no. I will reignite those. I can strengthen. I can bring life back in. So even when we're weak, there is the hope that God will still stimulate real life and bring that to a flame. So what's the reality then in our lives? If we do what Paul says, test myself. What's the evidence Look at my daily life. What do I do from the time I get up till I go to bed? What do I do with my free time? What do I do with my money? What, are, what is really my pursuit? And if it's of all worldly things, I could be the greatest person in the world and still be lost. It's not about performance. It's what does your heart say? Is there life? So it's not making that profession of faith. It's not just being baptized or being a church member or, or being faithful and in Christian service, though, those will be signs, but those are signs. Those are fruits. That's not what necessarily marks a Christian. How many times do we think about this terrifying passage in Matthew 7 where many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, look at what we did. Well, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We performed many miracles in your name. And I'm going to tell them, depart from me. You who practice lawlessness, I never knew you. It's not the profession. It's not the outward things. Is there life? Is there power? So many scriptures having to do with power. Just a, a few. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power. Has power been realized in our lives? It's the power of God for salvation. The word of God or I'm sorry, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God. And my message and my preaching, Paul said, were not in persuasive words of wisdom. But what were they in? They were demonstration of the spirit and of power. So that your faith doesn't rest on wisdom of men, but 
the power of God. And we could go on and on. The power. Is there power? Is there overcoming power? Am I putting to death the flesh? Is there growth in my, in, in my, my, my knowledge of God and therefore my love of God and my, my pursuit of him? And, and is my life being conformed? Am I dying to myself? I mentioned that last week. Just the power of God. Because there are those, Paul tells Timothy, who hold to a form it looks like it. It's a form of godliness. He says, but they have denied its power. And he says, avoid people like that. Those who look the part, but they're not really. Again, what does this say to me? The new nature is demonstrated in how a person thinks, how they speak, how they conduct their lives, how they react to things, the things that I love, the things that I now am pursuing. And in all of that, Christ is going to be at the heart of it. It's not just good deeds, it's Christ. Do I want to know the Lord? He becomes the object of everything about me. My appetites have changed. My desires have changed. My longings have changed. Even on the negative side, now my hatreds are different than they used to be. The things that repulse me are different than what they used to be. I have new antagonisms. The the things that are anti-Christ, that are... That are, that are against God. Everything about me has changed. And what's really beautiful is when those things take place and you can't even explain why. I just, I just don't care about that anymore. Well, you know, I care about this. and I didn't used to. That's the sign of the working of God. I didn't make that determination. My affections have changed and that can only come by a new life that is in me. So life within, that's really what defines a Christian. Is there life? Looking, acting the part is not necessarily indicate life. And that's why Jesus gave the parable of the wheat and the tares. The tares look just like wheat, but they had no substance, no real life in them. Life of the plant, but no fruit. But they look the same. They grow up in the same place. And yet one is the real thing and one is an imitation. So is my salvation genuine or is it counterfeit? Is there life of God in me or is it all on the surface? What does the evidence, when I get alone with myself, in my thoughts, in the middle of the night, what is it that speaks to me? What's the ongoing testimony of my life? Is it progressing? Am I demonstrating the life of God? We enter into salvation at one given point. So it might be May the 10th, 1964. But that's not the conclusion. That's not the sum of it. If that's all I have, if that's what I'm hoping in, I better be, I better consider whether I am in Christ. Because if I am, It will be ongoing. It will be continuous. It won't be perfect, but it will be the pursuit. That will be the objective. That's what's so beautiful. One of the aspects of Pilgrim's progress is he makes these bad choices. He gets off the path. He gets lazy. I mean, all of those things reflect the realities we find. But all in all, he had one objective, and that was to go to the celestial city. So even when he got off into the and, and into despair and, and, and off the track and, 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 and was fearful through the valley of the shadow and all those things, there was one pursuit. He just kept his eyes forward. And that's why we're told in Hebrews to fix our eyes on Jesus. Fix them on him. He's the only thing that will get us there. Nothing else will. He supersedes all. He is Christianity. Christ alone. It's not form. It's not practice. It's not behaviors. It's Christ alone. So the question is for us, is there life? Is there fruit? Be it great or small, being produced. Am I growing in Christ? Is it real or is it artificial? Again, you look at flowers. Artificial ones, beautiful, but they're not real. There's no life in them. Is there life? Is it real? Is it the authentic article? Because Jesus says, again, 
to be very careful because he says there are those who worship me in vain because they teach the doctrines of men rather than the truth of God. We can't let man's idea, we can't let religion's idea, we can't let anything usurp the place of Christ. He alone is Christianity, he alone is salvation, and he alone can impart life. So in chapter 20 of John's gospel, he sums up his whole reason for writing all of those 20 chapters up to that point. When he said, this is why it's been done. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. It's all pointed to Jesus, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's what it's all about. Is there life? Life in Christ, the life of Christ. Is that the reality in my life? Or am I hoping in something that I did once? Am I hoping in the things that I'm doing physically? What is it? Is there life? And that's what we should be seeking, life. Paul says in Colossians, talking about Sabbaths and new moons and, you know, all of the, the religious stuff. He says, these things which are a mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. He's the substance. There's life in no other. There's not life in anything I can do, any religious thing I can do. There is no life. Is there life is the question. That's what a Christian is. Is there life? May God help us to see where we stand and, and to not settle, not settle for a form of Christianity, but deny its power, but seek the life. Believe that there is power in the word of God and the spirit of God. Pursue life. Is there life? That's what a Christian is. Well, God, help us. Who will help us? I'm just so thankful that you have life and that you give your life. Oh, Lord, don't let us settle for mere form and, and, and performance and, and really emptiness. But, Lord, life. And Lord, breathe that life into us. And continue to pour oil on the flame of your people, that it will continue to burn and we will burn brighter and brighter, that we will know the power of God and not just religion. Lord, thank you for the hope and thank you for just opening your word to us and, and giving your spirit and, and, and that you are a merciful, merciful God. Well, please help us to see these truths and, and not to be satisfied with anything other than the life of Christ in us. And that's only by your grace, and we praise you for it. We praise you for it. Lord, humble us before you that we cannot take any pride of anything of ourselves, that we cannot just hold to to things of the flesh that can be produced. But, but Lord, give us your life. You will bring glory to your name because only you can do that. And, and we pray that you would glorify yourself in us as a people. Be real. Be, move here among us and, and do your work that only you can do and help us to put ourselves aside. And, and, and Lord, we just, we just say humbly, thank you, thank you. Help us to have greater love and thanksgiving and and, and brokenness before you because of the mercies of God on, on wretched, sinful flesh. Even expose me. Expose that flesh that, that, that is resistant to you. Expose it. Because I know that in the end, it is like the scalpel of a surgeon. It cuts, it hurts, it injures, but it's for the sake of healing. So God, please have mercy on us. I praise you for the hope again that, that we have in you. Oh God, please come.
In the name of Jesus, I ask it. Amen.